by the causes mercy of Sri Guranda Karanga. For several days, after hearing the glories of Balaram Prabhu, we have been discussing the first verse of Srimad Bhagavatam. So from this, hearing the commentaries of our Acharyas, of only one verse, then we may begin to develop some idea, some conception <coughs> of the profound nature, indeed the unlimited, supernatural, transcendental nature of Srimad Bhagavatam. So we have about three classes left of our festival here in Anandham this year. So I want to look at a very famous episode from the 8th canto, chapter 5 of Srimad Bhagavatam. It is the Kirsagar Mantan Lila, the pastime of churning of the ocean of milk. So first, we'll just hear the pastime. So that's perhaps you've heard it before, you've read it before, perhaps not. Just so that the pastime is fresh in your mind. And we'll look at some of the insights into that pastime. Then after that, we want to discuss what are the deep lessons which are relevant to us. Because you may think that some mythical creatures churning a milk ocean is not very relevant <laughs> to current affairs. But nothing could be further from the truth. By hearing the explanation of this pastime, our eyes become opened to real nectar. So this pastime is very famous, I remember. I think it's in the in the airport at Bangkok. Have you seen? In the airport at ba in Bangkok, in the transit lounge, there's a huge statue of this Lila. It must be about 30 meters long with a mountain in the middle and Rasuki around it and huge on one side so many demigods all pulling like a tug of war and on the other side so many devatas so this pastime is known from the Vedas and uh, you'll find it all over India all over Indonesia Asia it's very well known. So how it began? Prikshit Maharaj <coughs> inquired from Shukadev Goswami why did Lord Vishnu churn the ocean of milk? What things were how did the Devatas obtain the nectar and what other things were produced from the churning of this ocean? Kindly describe all these wonderful activities of the Lord. So Shukadev Goswami began to explain that once there was a big battle between the demons and the demigods. And in this battle, the demons were victorious. The demigods were smashed. There were many were died, many were mortally injured. Why? Because once Indra was riding on his elephant and the great sage, he was passing and he saw the great sage Dorvasamuni. Dorvasamuni being very gracious to Indra 
gave him his flower garland. But Indra, being somewhat intoxicated with his own pride, instead of honoring that garland, he put it on the head of his elephant. That was a big mistake. Because the elephant just said, what's this thing on my head? And he didn't have the consciousness awareness to understand the value of the Prasadi garland of Durvasa Rishi. So the elephant was irritated and he just grabbed it with his trunk and threw it on the ground and trampled it under his feet. So then, Durvasa Muni, being a, a portion of Lord Shiva, is easily pleased, but is also, his Ashutosh, easily pleased, but also easily angered. So, he gave a curse to Indra. He said, you along with all the three worlds will lose your prosperity. So then, next time there was a conflict with the demons, the powerful beings from the lower portion of the universe, then all the devatas were defeated. What do we learn from this? Don't make offenses. We may think that we are powerful and we have so many skills and abilities and everything. But actually, everything depends on the blessings of our Guruja, of our seniors. And if honorable, respectable persons are minimized, censured, or disrespected in any way, then whatever you have, you'll lose it. It was never yours anyway. See, Krishna said, whatever wonderful, beautiful, and opulent manifestations there are in this world, you should know, Arjuna, that they are but one small spark of my splendor. So, never consider whatever opulences, skills, talents, abilities that you have, that they are yours. Never take credit for them. Always know, Shishi Guru Gauranga Jayataha. All glory goes to Guru and Gauranga. Then one can remain humble. So, Indra, Varuna and the other Devatas, seeing their lives were ruined, they consulted among themselves, but they couldn't come up with a solution. So they went together to the assembly of Lord Brahma on the peak of Sumeru mountain. So we mentioned the other day, there's one, Brahma has one form in Satyalok and he has another form on the peak of Mount Sumeru. That is called Viraja Brahma. Yeah. yeah. So, you can see in uh, Srimad Bhagavatam, before Sri Krishna appeared, Mother Earth and the Devatas, they approached Lord Brahma because of the, the distress caused by the burden of so many demonic, so many kings who are actually demons in disguise had burdened the earth prior to the appearance of Sri Krishna. And then together with Lord Brahma, they went to the shore of the ocean of milk. So those demigods, they went to Sumeru, the Bra Viraja Brahma, on the top of Sumeru. They didn't go to such a look. How do we know? Because we have heard that the father-in-law of Balaram, Kakudmi Maharaj, he went to such a look. And Lord Brahma was listening to a musical performance by Aha and Huhu Gandharva. There. And then when he finished the musical performance, then he, t he told King Kakudmi, Oh, all the princes that you want to marry your daughter, they died millions of years ago. But just now, Balaram will appear. So go to earth and Balaram. Balaram is already there in Dwarka and she can marry him. So, this is the praman, the evidence that the demigods, they went to the Viraja Brahma on Sumeru and not to Brahma on Satyalok. Because if they'd gone there, he would be listening to the performance of Haha and Huhu Gandharva. Mm. So, 
So they went to Sumeromantu and where the Viraja Brahma lives. And they gave pranams to him. And Brahma, he was he felt compassion for the Devatas who had lost everything. They lost their strength and their influence. So then he meditated on the lotus feet of the Supreme Lord. And then he spoke to them. And he said, Let's go together and take shelter of that one Supreme Lord from whom myself, Brahma, Lord Shiva, and all of you Devatas, even the demons and the human beings and the animals and plants even, and all living entities, they all you know, derive their potency. So, Lord Brahma said, The Supreme Lord does not kill anyone. And neither does He protect anyone. He does not despise anyone. And He does not favor anyone. Sammoham saravabhu cheshu name As Krishna said in Bhagavad Gita, I am equal to everyone. I don't favor this one. And I don't hate this one. That's something very profound. We'll have to see. Because generally people look at someone who is successful in life, they think, oh, God has blessed him. And someone who is uh, struggling and failing, oh, God is cursing him. Hmm? So we project our own dualities of attachment and aversion hmm, upon God. And this is one of the topics that this pastime will address. And by hearing it, that fault of projecting Though the Supreme Lord has human-like qualities, they're transcendental human-like qualities. They're not our dualistic human-like qualities. And the tendency is that we project our conception, our human conceptions, onto transcendental being. So, Brahma said, he's not like that. However, he does accept forms those are the, the Guna avatars, Brahma, Shiva and Vishnu. He accepts forms as the Guna avatars to empower Rajas, Sattva and Tamas at the appropriate times in order to create, maintain and destroy the universe. So he empowers Brahma with Rajas to create the universe. Vishnu himself hmm, the empowers the mode of goodness and the devatas to maintain dharma in the universe and at the time of destruction he empowers Lord Shiva to destroy the universe. But in the midst of those macro cycles of the creation, maintenance and destruction of the universe, there are also fluctuations throughout the yugas, throughout the ages where sometimes sattva becomes predominant, sometimes rajas becomes predominant and during those fluctuations the, the demigods are victorious when sattva is prominent and when rajas becomes more prominent then the demons invade and take over heaven for some time and then sattva becomes prominent again and they get all thrown out and the demigods get their abode back and so on like that. So there are the macro cycles of the three gunas and there are the micro cycles as well. Within. So Lord Brahma said now is the time when the Lord who accepts this activity of empowering sattva will protect those who have proper conduct for the welfare of all living entities. So therefore, we should take shelter of the Guru of the universe. Being affectionate to us devatas, he will bless us with prosperity. So then, after Brahma smiling and joyfully announced this to the devatas, that in other words, now this cycle of the the rise of tamas is coming to an end and the sattvic cycle will come so surely uh, they will uh, their, all their difficulties will come to an end so then Brahma along with all the devatas they went to uh, Shweta Dweep to the shore of the milk ocean where there's an island and their supreme lord re resides in a Narayan form a Vishnu Murti called Ajita, Ajita, the unconquerable Lord. So when they came on the shore of the ocean of milk, 
Lord Brahma, he fixed his mind and began to offer the prayers of the Purusha Shukta. Om Sahasra Shisha Purusha Sahasraksha Sahasrapati Sabhumin Vishwato Vritva Atyatista Darsangulam Purusha Evinagam Sarvam Yadhutat Chats Chabhavyam Utham Ritatyasthenana from Rig Veda. So Brahmaji led the Devatas in the chanting of the Purusha Sutta. So at that time, the Supreme Lord could not be seen by anyone. Then the Devatas prayed, We offer respect to that Supreme Lord by whose dear form empowering sattva gun we have been created understand that from the element of ahankar the transformation of ahankar in sattva, sattva gun produces the devatas who are the predominating um, deities of the senses indra controls the hands Agni controls speech, Surya controls the, the, the sight, and so on. So, so we, so the David has said, we have been created by the predominantly sattvic transformation of Ahankar, ego. And therefore, we, my Lord, we do not know your subtle nature. Muyanti hmm? Yatsuraya. Huh? Even though your subtle nature is manifested eternally before us as the influence of time. Krishna said, Kalos me, I am time. And outwardly we see as time and inwardly as Antaryami. But the demons who are in Rajas and Tamas, they cannot understand you at all. Oh my Lord, we are surrendered to you and we wish to see you. Please make your form with lotus face and beautiful smile visible to your devotees. Oh my Lord, even a small shadow of action offered to you does not go in vain. So the, de the Devatas were praying in this way. So what is uh, important here is if you do a lot of activities, a lot of karmas, but they will not give any results unless the Supreme Lord is respected. So if a person, even if they're doing their worldly activities at the end, they just say, Oh my Lord, I offer this activity to you. Hmm? Then just by this touch of awareness of God in one's activities, then those activities can produce fruit and become successful. Hmm? On the other hand, hmm? if a person doesn't do any karmic activities, and he just does bhakti, devotion to the Lord, then he gets the fruit of all the karmic activities also, if necessary, even though he didn't do those activities. So, Krishna has said in the Bhagavad Gita, Yagyeshu, ve, sorry, Vedeshu, Yagyeshu, Tapasu, Chaiva, Dhaneshu, Yapunya, Palam, Pratistam, Atyeti, Tatsaravam, Idam, Viditva, Yogi, Paranstanam, Upeti, Chadyam. Chapter 8 of Bhagavad Gita. Krishna said, A person who engages in devotional service is not bereft of the results of studying the Vedas, performing sacrifices, performing austerities, giving in charity, but rather he attains the fruit of all of these things without even doing them. Plus, in addition to that, in the end, he goes to the transcendental abode. So every type of activity is a failure unless it's connected with Krishna. And if you neglect all of your duties totally and don't do any duties whatsoever, but you serve Krishna, you get the result of doing all your duties and on top of that attain the divine abode. So what intelligent person? Tivrena bhakti yogena yajeta The udharadi the, the one who is broad-minded, who is intelligent, 
then they must engage in devotional service. Eh? One would be foolish to neglect the path of bhakti, to do other things which are so insignificant. Also in Srimad Bhagavatam it is said, Yata Toro Mula Nisei Chaneena Tripyanti Tatskanda Bajopaseka that was the second line. We're on the fourth line now. Tataiva Sarvahanam Apjucheja. Okay. So, so the verse said, just as by pouring water on the root of a tree, then all the branches and leaves attain benefits, or just as by feeding the pran, all the senses come to life. Actually, there's only one pran. But that pran divides itself and empowers all of the eleven senses. So, you don't have to feed the senses individually. You just feed the pran. And then all the eleven senses become enlivened. So in the same way, simply by serving Krishna, then all the... everyone in this world, all the devatas, they're automatically worshipped. You see, because essentially... When you do karmic activities, you have to do yagyas and worship demigods and so on. So if you neglect karma, you're essentially neglecting the demigods. But if you serve Krishna, all the demigods are just different parts of his viratrup, his universal form. So automatically, just by serving Krishna, all the devatas have been worshipped. And not only all devatas. Mavaiving bangso jiva loke jiva bhuta sanatana Every, you have honored every living entity in existence also <coughs> by serving Krishna. <clears throat> so then, the Devita said, O oh my Lord, we offer respect to you who are unlimited, whose actions are inconceivable, and who may or may not offer us material benedictions. <laughs> so, the Devitas are saying that you are unlimited and even though we are omniscient to a certain degree right? so if Indra is in the hands of everyone Indra knows what everyone's hands are doing right? if Surya Dev is in the eye of everyone empowering everyone's eyes then he knows what everyone is seeing so these Devitas in regard to the, the particular universe in which they live they have a relative level of omniscience, right? So they say, we are omniscient to a degree, but we don't have your omniscience. We cannot understand what you will do. Your activities are inconceivable. Hmm? If the Lord will say to them, but I am mercy, merciful, so from that you know that I will fulfill your desires, the desires of Indra and other devotees. Hmm? So the devotees are saying, but my Lord, by your mercy, you don't always give material benefits. Hmm? So then the Lord is saying, then why are you praising me? Hmm? So they said in the end, Sattvastaya sa sampratam means because you are the, you maintain Sattva Gun. And therefore, by maintaining Sattva Gun, naturally we'll regain our positions once again. In other words, the demigods ended their prayer with, Oh my Lord, we take shelter of you. You are wonderful, you are inconceivable, but please give us our positions back in this material world because we want to continue enjoying. Okay. So, that means that these devatas, they are not pure devotees. That is clear from their prayers. They are not praying, Oh my Lord, Oh my Lord, you're great, you're wonderful, you're fantastic. And by the way, could you just get around to maintaining Sattva in the universe so that we, the, who are the transformations of false ego in Sattva can get our positions back. So that was, they didn't say it openly, but it was fairly transparent. So, <laughs> so suddenly, Huh? Now actually, Lord Brahma is a pure devotee. Hmm? 
So they were lucky to have his association. So suddenly there and then, the Supreme Lord appeared. And when he appeared, he appeared with the brilliance of thousands of suns. And all the Devatas were blinded by his effulgence. They couldn't see him. They couldn't even see themselves. They couldn't see each other even. There was so much light there. So Lord Brahma and Lord Shiva, they gave Dandavat Pranam on the ground. And they began to pray to the Lord. And they saw, because Lord Shiva is a pure devotee, Brahma is a pure devotee. They saw the form of the Lord with lotus eyes, with a blackish complexion, with the disc club conch and lotus flower, with beautiful garland and golden crown, with attractive limbs, with mm, uh, ankle bells, beautiful earrings, and the mark of Lachmi upon his chest. So then Brahma, he prayed to that appearance of Lord Ajita. He said, Oh my Lord, as one can derive fire from wood, milk from a cow, food grains from the earth, and water from the land, and one can get livelihood from doing one's endeavors. So in the same way, by the practice of Bhakti Yoga, human beings can realize you. Even though they are situated in this world, they can realize you. So, here Brahma is giving many examples how a person practicing Bhakti Yoga can have a darshan of the Supreme Lord. He said first, The human beings can see you just as one derives fire from wood. So the meaning is that if you learn from someone how to rub the sticks together, then if you practice that after rubbing for quite some time, gradually smoke comes and then fire manifests. So in the same way, if you approach a guru and the guru teaches you Param Vijayate Shri Krishna Sankirtana Nam Tattva and how to chant the holy name without offenses. Then you practice that sadhana and then after some time the fire will appear. That is the, in this analogy represents the Supreme Lord will appear before you. So just as one attains fire from wood just as one attains milk from a cow. So the inner meaning of this example is if you want to attain milk from a cow, it's made very easy if you have the help of a calf. Because if you bring the calf close to the cow, then the cow becomes overwhelmed with motherly affection. And the calf will drink a little milk, and then you tie the, ca the calf to one side. And then when you milk the cow, it's very easy. The milk is just flowing and flowing and flowing. So in the same way, for, for those who uh, have sadhu sangha, then attaining the Lord's mercy is very easy. Because that sadhu you associate with starts the mercy of the Lord flowing. And then you can also avail yourself of that mercy by doing bhakti in that sadhu's association. So then, as one gets food grains, hmm, food from grains, That means, if a person, they have associated with the sadhu in a previous life, and by hearing from them, they have received Vishesh Sanskar, the Bhakti Lata Beach, the seed of devotion. Then, they cultivate that, and just as one cultivates a seed which is in the earth, you can get a fruit. So similarly, by cultivating that seed of devotion received in a previous life, then in this life, the person practices a little and then the fruit of love of God comes and they have darshan of Krishna. Then, the next example is as one attains water from the earth. This means in a previous life, 
A devotee received the Bhaktilata Beach and they did a very intense sadhana. But it wasn't quite mature. Then they gave up that body, then in their next life, just as a person just gets a shovel and digs a little bit and sees how the, the water table is there and finds water. So simply that devotee, who has made considerable advancement in the previous life, in this life he just practices a little bit and pew, he attains the Supreme Lord. So then, the last example, just as one attains his livelihood by work, it refers to the devotee who is very mature in bhakti. You know, if you do a job, you do that job and then you get paid in your hand, cash in the hand. So the devotee who is considerably advanced, these are examples of devotees who have made more and more advancement in previous lives. So they just do puja and there and then they get the results, right there and then as they are doing the puja. So Lord Brahma prayed uh, that various living entities in different stages of maturity of their bhakti, by bhakti yoga, they directly have your darshan. Oh Master, having seen you, you are the long desired goal of life. You have directly appeared before us. We have all attained bliss today. Just as an elephant who is being afflicted by a forest fire feels really wonderful when he jumps into the Ganges. So Lord Brahma here is describing what it's like to actually have darshan of the Supreme Lord as they are having at that moment. They feel like, you know, when there's a forest fire and the elephants are afraid and they're running, running. But they arrive at the river, they just jump in. And, ah, such a relief. So, Lord Brahma said, What can I and Lord Shiva and all the Devatas and the Pajapatis like Daksha understand about our own welfare? Because we're just like sparks, tiny sparks, and you are like a great fire. So we don't know our, about our welfare. So please give us some means of deliverance for the Devatas and the Brahmanas. So in this prayer, Lord Brahma is giving us a wonderful instruction, a very important instruction. And that is, as we perform bhakti, we have to give up vidya buddhi. That means the ego that we are so intelligent and we know so much, we've learned so much. In other words, in fact, Srila Vishnu Thakur, he paraphrases that when Lord Brahma says, My Lord, what can we insignificant beings know about our own welfare? His inner feeling is, May our intelligence go to hell. <laughs> because material intelligence is exactly that, material. So what can it know about the welfare of the soul and the nature of the Supreme Lord? So, my Gurudev, he always used to say, when you sit and you remember your Gayatri Mantra, then you'll have to be like Vyasadeva. Even though Vyasadeva had compiled all the Vedas, when Narad Muni blessed him to go into trance, Bhakti Yogi Namanasi Samyak Pranihite Malay, then Vyasadeva, he gave up all Vidya Bhutti. He thought, I am foolish. I don't know anything. So that is the preliminary stage before praying for Prachodayat Tane Pramari Dayani. For the Lord to manifest Himself. Because as long as we have the Abhiman, Vidya Buddhi, the, the consciousness, I have knowledge, I have understanding, I am intelligent, I am learned, no realization will come. So before remembering mantras, give up all Vidya Buddhi completely. Similarly, also many devotees, they read Srimad Bhagavatam once, they say, I read that, now what shall I read? So in this way, because they think they have knowledge, uh, then it stops them from actually attaining knowledge and having the experience, developing their relationship with Krishna in his form of Srimad Bhagavatam. <clears throat> so then, although Lord Ajit was capable of rectifying the situation himself just by his will. 
You know, he could just raise an eyebrow and all the demons would be incinerated and turned to ash and the demigods could be installed back in the heavenly planets and all they could be well and healthy. He can do anything simply by his desire, his satya sankalpa, his swarat. He knows that. But he wanted to enjoy a special pastime. <laughs> the pastime of journeying the ocean of milk. So this is true of all the pastimes of Krishna. You can see when any demon comes to Vrindavan, like Vyomasur, we go to that place in Kamyavan where Krishna was fighting with Vyomasur. And there's a rock there which carries the imprint of Krishna's mukut. Because Krishna was struggling with so much with Vyomasur, wrestling with him, that his crown fell off onto the ground. Yeah. So that, that mark on the stone of Krishna's mukut is so significant. Hmm? Why? Because why is he wrestling with this demon? Hmm? He doesn't even have to raise his eyebrow and the demon's finished. In fact, it's his power which is giving power to the demon to fight with him. Right? So, the reason he is wrestling or doing anything is Madbhaktanam Vinodatam Karomi Vividakriya In the uh, Puranas, the Supreme Lord has said, I do so many activities. Why? To please my devotees. It's out of love. Only out of love. So even though the Lord, He could have rectified the situation, He wanted to enjoy pastimes. And therefore, Lord Ajit spoke to them. He said, O oh Brahma, O oh Shiva, and other devotees, please hear me with great attention. Don't sleep. <laughs> huh? And then you will have great fortune. He said, as long as you are not flourishing, you should make a truce, a peace treaty with the demons. And then, because at the moment they are being favored by Kal, time is on their side. Because it's the rise of Rajas and Tamas now in the universe. But after some time, when Sattva rises up again, you become stronger. Then you can change your plan. You can rather bathe in another way. So Supreme Lord, he said, O Devatas, to attain an important goal, sometimes one may even have to make a truce with one's enemies. But upon attaining one's goal, then one should follow the logic of the snake and the mouse. Hmm? So there are many different types of logic. Do you know the logic of the snake and the mouse? So... A snake and a mouse, they were trapped inside a basket. So, being trapped inside the basket, they would die, for sure. Of hunger, because there's nothing to eat. However, the snake could think, well, I can eat the mouse. But the problem is this, if he eats the mouse, he'll never get out of the basket. But the mouse can gnaw on the, the weave of the basket and make a hole. And then they can both get out. And so the logic of the snake and the mouse is that the snake thinks, I'm not going to eat the mouse. Let him make a hole in the basket first so I can get out. And then I'll eat him later. Uh, so Supreme Lord is saying, Okay, demigods, now time is on the side of the demons. Make a truce with them and then later when you're strong, you, you can kill them. Essentially. So this is called niti, niti, or proper conduct, diplomacy, political strategy. So then, the Supreme Lord said, you should make a truce with them and together you should endeavor to produce nectar from the ocean of milk. By churning the ocean of milk, nectar will come and then all your devatas who are injured and about to die and even those who have died, by the touch of that nectar they can be revived again. So, the Supreme Lord told them the method, the recipe, how to get the nectar out of the ocean. First of all, Lord Ajit said, you should cast all kinds of vegetables, grass, creepers and herbs into the ocean of milk. 
And then with my help, you should make the Mandra mountain the churning rod. And the great snake Vasuki should be the rope. Has anyone ever churned yogurt to make butter? Raise your hand if you've done it. Huh? So you know what it's like. Yeah, the rope goes around the stick and then around the post. And you have to pull drrr, drrr, this way and that. It's very hard work. Hmm? You really get, on, get a sweat on. Hmm? And then after some time, suddenly the, the butter appears from the yogurt. So, in this example, the rope will be Vasuki and Mandara mountain will be the churning rod. So, <clears throat> the Lord said, the demons will be engaged in this labor along with you, but only you will take the result. So that's the example of the snake and the mouse. My dear demigods, with patience and with peace, everything can be achieved. But, if one is agitated by anger, then the goal will not be achieved. This is very important. The churning of the ocean of milk is an analogy for attaining the Amrit to the nectar of Bhakti. Srimad Bhagavatam itself gives the nectar, Rasa Amrita. But you have to go through carefully hearing under the guidance of Gurudev and pure Vaishnavas all the cantos gradually one by one up to the 10th canto and 11th and finally 12th canto and, and then nectar is produced. Srila Sanatana Goswami also in Sri Briyad Bhagavatam Rita he discusses different levels of devotees from a, a Brahmin and on this earth a king Lord Indra Lord uh, Brahma and uh, Lord Shiva and he goes up Hanuman and all different levels of devotees. Sanatana Goswami's goal is to, is to impart to us the nectar of Gopi Bhav, the mood of Braja Gopis. But to get this nectar, there, there's a churning process. And this churning process takes time and patience and humility. And so here the Lord is saying, by patience and peacefulness, Everything can be done, you can achieve your goal. But if along the way you become agitated, you become angry, you will not attain your goal. So always, never lose, never lose the, the thread or the, the, the plot, the purpose of your life is to attain Krishna Prem. So in the course of your life, your destiny, your sadhana, your association. There may come many trying circumstances uh, which may cause you to be agi become agitated or angry and it can result in some argument, some offense and, and leaving the path of bhakti for a considerable amount of time. So take these words into your heart and always remember them. So, the Lord said, if you are angry or agitated, you will not attain your goal. Therefore, I advise you, whatever the demons ask of you, just agree to their proposal. Because goals in life can be achieved. But sometimes we may have to compromise with certain situations. And be patient until we, that situation is overcome. The Lord said, you should not fear from the poison known as Kalkut Bish, which will be generated from the ocean of milk. That means that when you start to do something auspicious, many obstacles will arise. You know? When you are going to do something completely stupid in your life, then you'll see that the path is clear and everyone is cheering you on. <laughs> But when you're going to do something, you know, something actually auspicious and beneficial, at once many obstacles will appear. That's the sign. So don't give up. So this is indicated by the fact that they're trying to make the nectar, but the first thing that will produce is nectar. Problems. Sorry, poison. Poison. So this, this pastime is, it's true, it really happened. In the higher realms. But it has so many allegorical dimensions 
related to our practical life, wisdom in our practical life. So, don't be afraid of the poison. Keep going. And also, don't be greedy, lusty, or angry when other products arise from the churning of the ocean. Because before the nectar comes, so many other things will come. So bhakti is also like that. Before you attain your perfection, before you even attain nishta, tarangarangini will come. Tarangarangini is a stage. Oh, just before you attain nishta, where everyone, oh, many people around you, they think, ah, you are a Mahabhagwat Vaishnava. And you may also think, I am a Mahabhagwat Vaishnava. And then they give you money and facilities and all kinds of things. And instead of intensely doing sadhana, chanting Harinam for hours every day, studying Shastra and preaching on behalf of your Guru Parampara, you just start to relax and enjoy the facilities which are coming as a byproduct of mixed bhakti. So watch out for that. So here, he's saying, so many wonderful things will appear from the ocean. So if you just take them and stop churning, then you'll not attain your goal. So that is like Tarangarangi. So, by this the Lord is saying that jewels will come, beautiful ladies and so many different things. And if the demons grab them, just let the demons have it. Stay focused. Be a icantic, one-pointed on attaining your goal. Vyavasaya Mukha Buddhiya Ekeha Kurunandana Bahu Sakaya Nantasya Buddhaya Vyavasaya In Gita chapter 2, Sri Krishna said that those who are on this path are resolute in purpose and their aim is one. The intelligence of those who are irresolute, not fixed on their goal, is many branched. Their mental energy becomes splayed out into so many different projects which are ultimately superfluous to the attainment of their ultimate goal. So, after advising the Devatas in this way, the Supreme Lord disappeared. Brahma and Shiva again bowed down and then they returned to their abodes. And now Indra and all the Devatas, they had their instructions, they had their mission, they began to carry it out. So they set off to have a meeting with Bali Maharaj, the king of the demons. So as the Indra and the Devatas approached, then Bali Maharaj, he looked. And his commanders, his warriors were there, seeing the Indra and the demigods, some of the demigods coming. They grabbed their swords, but Bali Maharaj said, stop, stop. No. He restrained them. Because he could see that Indra and his chief associates, they were coming without armor and without weapons. So he knew they were not coming for battle. So Bali Maharaj, he was judicious and he thought, uh, they want to talk to us, Let's, we'll find out what they want. So then, the Devatas, they approached Bali, who had conquered all directions and was surrounded by the highest luxury and protected by so many commanders of the demonic armies. So they spoke pleasing words, mild words, words to Bali Maharaj. And then Indra su uh, submitted his proposal. That was, Oh Bali, I have a suggestion, we should make peace. And if we combine together, we can churn the ocean of milk and we can all get Amrita nectar. Because individually, separately, we cannot do it. But if we combine our forces together, then we can get this nectar. So, Bali Maharaj heard this and thought it was a good proposal. So they made an agreement and they became friends, at least externally. And then they organized themselves to put this plan into action. Now, what's actually going on here? Bali Maharaj was thinking, ah, the logic of the snake and the mouse. Huh? They're speaking to each other on friendly terms and making a truce and 
collaboration. But both of them are thinking, oh, but when this nectar appears, then we'll kill the other one and take the nectar for ourselves. So there's complete duplicity on both sides here. So they set off. And first they have to go to Mandara mountain, which is a huge mountain. It's uh, 800,000 miles wide. And it's made of gold. So gold is actually more dense than rock. So that means it's even heavier than an actual a stone mountain. So all the demons and demigods who are immensely powerful, they have arms like iron rods with their strength together. They said, one, two, three, and all the demons and demigods, they uprooted the Mandara mountain and they began to carry it in the direction of the ocean of milk. However, because it was very far from the Mandara mountain, to the ocean of milk, gradually they became more and more tired and they just couldn't take the weight. Hmm? And some demons and demigods, they began to fall over and they dropped the mountain and some of them were squished and they all became depressed because it was just, they realized we can't even get this mountain to the ocean. What to speak of churning everything. Huh? So just as they were sitting around all discouraged and exhausted, then, <laughs> flapping his wings, making the sound of the Samaveda, Garuda with the Supreme Lord Ajita riding on his back, arrived there. The Supreme Lord, with one hand, just lifted the mountain. He's Giridhari, right? So he just lifted the mountain with one hand, put it on the back of Garuda, and smiling, he took off and flew. <laughs> And in this way, because the Lord had told Indra, with my help, you should bring the Mandara mountain. So, and he bought the Mandara mountain and he put it down at the shore of the ocean of milk. So then, all those demons and, and demigods who got injured and, and crushed by the, when they dropped the mountain, Lord Ajit just glanced at them and by his glance they all came back to life. And they became fresh and without any injuries. So then, when he put down the mountain at the shore of the ocean of milk, then the Lord Ajit, that four-armed Narayan form, dismissed Garuda. Garuda gave pranam and he flew away. Say goodbye to Garuda. <laughs> Om Swastino Vainateo. So why did the Supreme Lord tell Garuda to leave? Because now they have to bring Vasuki. You see? So Vasuki and Garuda, they don't get along so well. There's a, there's a long-standing feud going on between Garuda and the snakes, the snake race. So <laughs> Garuda flew away and then they summoned Vasuki, the king of the serpents. And they told him, listen, if you do this, because Vasuki was a shuzan, mm, I don't know about that. They said, listen, if you do this, don't worry, we'll give you a share of the nectar too. So that persuaded him. And so they, they pushed the Mandra mountain into the milk ocean and they wrapped Vasuki around it and the demons Actually, first Ajit, he went to the head of the snake and he picked up the head and all the demigods followed him. So then the demons, they went to the tail. But the demons, they were not uh, satisfied. They were thinking, wait a minute. The head is the highest portion and we have to have the, the tail end. That's not, we shouldn't accept this because... We have studied the Vedas. We are, have aristocratic birth. And we are renowned for our heroic activities. Why should these mm, beta wimps have the head when we have the tail? Mm? So then the demons, they just refused to pick up the tail. And they were standing there silently. Mm, they were on strike, yeah, exactly. 
So then, the supreme, the, the demigods, they were just looking at the jeet to take hints from him what to do. So then Ajit, he smiled and he just put down the head and he went and he walked to the other end. So then the, the demons, they were very happy. They thought, oh, these demigods, they know their place. <laughs> so all the demigods then and Ajit, Lord Ajit, they took the tail and the demons, they took the head. So then, the Lord, Supreme Lord was smiling at the demons when they demanded the head. And by his smile, he was thinking, you know, once we start churning, then Vasuki is going to start vomiting poison and fire and everything, and you're going to get roasted. So then, he moved. So then they all started to churn. But the problem was, they couldn't hold the, the mountain towards the top of the water. It was it, the top of the milk. It was sinking down and down. And uh, again they became depressed. And the beauty of their faces faded. So then at that time what happened? Shitiriya <laughs> vipulatare Tistati tava priste Darani darana kina chakra kariste Kesha padrita kurma sharira Jaya jaya devari Jaya jagati shari The Supreme Lord appeared in the form of a huge very beautiful turtle, Lord Karmadev. And he swam through the milk ocean and went under the mountain and picked it up. And now he became the pivot for the churning rod. So Jaidev Goswami in his Dasavatar Stotram has described, Oh my Lord, you appear so beautiful as you lift up the Mandra mountain. And when the demons and demigods are churning, then that scratches the itch on your back. Ah, that feels good. You know when someone scratches your back? Like that. So it was, that was his pastime. So, when the demons and demigods saw that Mandra mountain had been lifted, they were enlivened and began to churn again with full enthusiasm. So, the mountain was wobbling now on the back of Karma. So the Supreme Lord appeared in another form another Vishnu form on the top of the mountain and held it steady. So he was below the mountain, he was above the mountain and he was among the churners as well. Supreme Lord has three forms in this Lila. By the end of this Lila, Supreme Lord has appears in five different forms. But three, are, three have appeared so far. So, then, even then, the demons and the demigods and Vasuki, they were not capable, they were not powerful enough to perform this task. So what happened? Vishnu entered into the demons as the quality of passion. He entered into the devatas as the quality of goodness. And he entered into Vasuki as the quality of ignorance. Why? Because after a few moments of journey, it was pretty clear that Vasuki was going to die from the pain. <laughs> so, means that the Supreme Lord, He, he uh, inspired the energy of Tamas into Vasuki because in Tamas it's inertia, jadata. So he couldn't feel anything. He couldn't feel any pain. Otherwise he would fall completely unconscious. So at that time, when the Supreme Lord appeared on the top of the mountain to steady the mountain, then the Devatas showered flowers upon the Supreme Lord. So that means 
that the Devatas, on the one side, their original forms were holding Vasuki and churning, and they expanded themselves as other forms in the sky and showered flowers. So then, so much smoke and fire was coming from Vasuki. And the demons headed by Bali Maharaj, Poloma, Kaleya, Ilvala and others, they looked like pine trees that had been burnt in a fire. I don't know if you were in Russia, they have like big forests of pine trees. So if there's a fire, it's just these black stumps, right, charred stumps. So all the demons, they look like these charred trees. And even though the Devatas were far away on the other side, they also, their faces were blackened by smoke. And they became exhausted. So then by the will of the Lord, clouds gathered in the sky and poured rain and fresh breezes came. So still the nectar did not appear from the ocean. So then Ajit himself, taking up the head of the snake, he began to churn and give encouragement to the others. And gradually poison appeared. And slowly this poison began to spread everywhere. And everyone was terrified. So at that time, the demons and the demigods, they left that place. And Lord Ajit, he went with them, crossing the ocean, and came to Mount Kailash. And they began to pray to Lord Shiva. So the, the demigods, they prayed, O oh Mahadev, soul of all living entities, Protector of all living beings, please deliver us. We have come here to surrender to you and pray that you will save us from the poison. So, actually, Lord Ajit could have saved them. But Lord Ajit, he wanted to give glory to his pure devotee, Lord Shiva. So then Lord Shiva, he turned to his wife, Sati, Durga, Bhavani, and he said, Just see how all these living entities are in great danger because of this poison. It is my duty to give safety to all living entities who are struggling for existence, just as a master protects his suffering dependents. The people of this world who are bewildered by Maya are always engaged in animosity towards each other. But still, the devotees give protection to the living entities, even at the risk of their own temporary lives. So here, Lord Shiva is saying that when a devotee undergoes difficulties and problems for the sake of helping others even though they are envious and ungrateful and always engaged in quarrel with each other but he does this why because it's pleasing to the lord so lord shiva is also like our guru That for the sake of the happiness of Supreme Lord, he will drink poison uh, to give auspiciousness in the lives of those who actually have enmity with each other and are completely in Maya. So then Lord Shiva, he, by his mystic power, he reduced the poison which had spread everywhere into a, a small amount and took it in the palm of his hand and he drank it. But he didn't swallow it, he kept it in his throat and his throat became blue. Therefore Lord Shiva is famous by the name of Nilakanta, Nilakanta Mahadev. Some little drops fell on the ground and they were taken by various insects. And they became scorpions, snakes, tarantula spiders, whatever poisonous creatures there are, they der derive their poison from the, the drops of the Kalkut Bish, which was dropped by Lord Shiva. So then, all the d demigods and demons, they were very pleased 
because they'd been saved. And again, with the help of Ajit, they began to churn the ocean. So when they churned the ocean, the next thing that appeared was the Surabi cow. And the sages who followed the Vedas, they adopted that cow because she would provide them the necessities for sacrifice, such as ghee. Then, after that, came a horse called Uchaishrava. The horse was as white as the moon. And Bali Maharaj wanted this horse, so he took that horse. And Indra and the Devitas, they didn't protest because they remembered. The Lord said, don't become lusty, angry, greedy or anything. Whatever comes, let the demons take it if they want it. So then, the king of elephants, Airavata, with four tusks, came out from the ocean of milk. And Lord Indra took that. Then, a jewel came out, a type of ruby called Kostuba. And Lord Vishnu took that and... Put it, uh, wore it upon his chest. Then they continued to churn. And then the Parijat flower came. Which can fulfill all the desires of, of a person who approaches it. So, the Parijat flower is uh, Indra's. So then they kept churning and Apsaras, heavenly courtesans appeared. And they attracted all the people of Swargalok. Then they kept churning again and then Rama, that is Lakshmi Devi, she appeared from the ocean. So, at that time, the demons and demigods, they were attracted to her. Because actually Rama appeared, but there were two forms and they combined together. One form of Lakshmi Devi is the consort, the beloved of Supreme Lord and she is like the mother of all living entities and the other form of Lakshmi is the, pers the personification of wealth so th those with materialistic vision they wanted the wealth and fame and fortune from her so when she appeared Indra and the Devatas they performed uh, Abhishek a bathing ceremony for her Gandhava sang auspicious prayers and the demigods offered her various gifts. And then she took a garland in her hand because she wanted to select her husband. So she was looking at all the demons and demigods and she was trying to select who will be my husband. So in Srimad Bhagavatam it's mentioned. She thought some of these peace persons they are, they are austere. But they have not conquered anger. Hmm? Isn't that? Have you ever encountered that? Sometimes you meet someone who's very austere. But somehow or other they're really uptight. <laughs> they get really angry. She thought some have knowledge. But they haven't given up attachment. Some have power. But they have not overcome lust. Hmm? So here. These, are, these imply... They're not mentioned directly in Srimad Bhagavatam. But certain specific personalities are implied here. First of all, who is austere but didn't control anger? Durvasa Rishi. Hmm? Who has knowledge but is not free from material attachment? Prihaspati. Hmm? The guru of the demigods. Hmm? So, who, who is powerful? But has not conquered lust. Brahma. Yeah, Brahma is powerful. But there were some pastimes in relation to his daughter. And then she said, Some have dharma, but they are not friendly to all living beings. Some are charitable, but they are not interested in liberation. Some have strength, but they cannot stop the flow of time. Some are free from attraction to material and spiritual qualities, but they cannot be a suitable companion. So here these personalities are. Who has dharma, but is not friendly to everyone? Shukracharya. Shukracharya does dharma, but he is the guru of the demons. So he doesn't 
have friendship with all living beings. So, some give in charity, but they're not interested in liberation. Daksha Maharaj. So, some have strength, like Shumba and Nishumba, but they cannot stop the force of time. And some are detached from all material things. Hmm? All material qualities and spiritual qualities also. Who? The four Kumaras. But they cannot be a suitable companion. Right? The four Kumaras are not ready to get married to her, even to Lakshmi Devi. So, some have a long life, but they are not pious or auspicious. Some have a long life and they are, sorry, some have auspicious qualities and piety, but they don't have a long life. Hmm? So, here, Bali Maharaj has a long life, but he doesn't have auspicious qualities because being the leader of, he is the leader of the demons. So, some of them, uh, because he's the enemy of Indra, so he's considered to be without auspiciousness. Some, like the sons and daughters of Manu, they have good conduct, but they don't have long life. So, there are human beings who are very pious, but their life is very brief. And there are others who have good conduct and a long life, like Lord Shiva, but he does inauspicious actions, like living in a cremation ground. So therefore, Lakshmi Devi was noticing that everyone, they had some qualities but they also had some faults. But there was only one person who had no faults who was completely perfect. So after full deliberation, then Lakshmi Devi took a garland of newly grown lotus flowers and placed it around the neck of uh, Lord Ajita. So in this way, you know, the Srimad Bhagavatam teaches us how to overcome all nama parats. So the second one is Shivasya Sri Vishun Yaya Guna Nama Adi Sakalam Diyabe Nampasit Sakalu Harinama Hitakara To consider demigods like Lord Shiva to be equal to or independent of Lord Vishnu. So by this it's clearly shown that no one is equal to or independent of Lord Vishnu. And in this way one over can overcome this nama parat. So Then the chest of the Supreme Lord of the Three Worlds became the shelter of Lakshmi Devi. So then, when the demons, they became sad that they'd lo they lost the opportunity to catch this beautiful woman, Lakshmi Devi, they saw only the material opulence aspect of her. So again they began to churn and from the ocean appeared Varuni, the beautiful lotus-eyed goddess of getting intoxicated. So the demons at once jumped up, they wouldn't miss the, this, this chance. So then the demons, they took the goddess of intoxication. Then again they were churning and this time a wonderful male person appeared with a dark complexion, dressed in yellow garments, with beautiful curling locks of hair. And in his hand, he was carrying a pot. Who was it? Danvantari. So now the nectar has appeared in the hands of Danvantari. He was conversant in the science of medicine, in Ayurveda. So then, when the demons saw that Danvantari had finally appeared with the pot of nectar, then it was time for the logic of the snake and the mouse to kick in. So then once they jumped up and they snatched the pot of nectar from the hands of Danvantari. And they carried it off. And then all the devatas were, alas, alas, after all this hard work, we've lost everything. So then, Lord Ajit, he said to them, don't lament, don't be aggrieved. By my own energy, I will fulfill your goal by creating a dispute amongst them. Yachaktayo vadatam vaditam vai vivada sambhava bhuvo bhavanti We were discussing yesterday how uh, 
uh, it is the external energy of the Supreme Lord which causes agreement and disagreement among various mm, sects and various philosophers. So, all the demons, they went to a, a separate uh, place, a private place, and they're all greedy to taste the nectar. So one demon would say, I'll drink first. Another said, no, I'll, I'll take first. No, no, no. I am from a more aristocratic family than you. But I am senior to you. Your family is not so noble as mine. And then some of the, the weaker demons, they said, look, all the Devatas were also endeavoring equally with us. So they should also take an equal share. Everyone, we should have democracy and everyone should have equal rights. So, according to Bhagavatam, that mentality is the philosophy of weak demons. <laughs> so, so then, Shukadev Goswami said, the weaker demons constantly present, uh, uh, prevented the stronger demons from drinking the nectar. Right? That's communism. So, so all the weaker demons got together and with their arguments and philosophies, then they stopped the stronger demons from taking any nectar. Even though the stronger demons had taken the pot by force. So then at that time, Lord Vishnu manifested the form of Mohini Murti. An impossibly beautiful female form. She had a dark complexion and was carrying a blue lotus in her hands. Her cheeks were very beautiful. Her breasts were heavy. And her waist was very thin. Bumblebees were attracted by the aroma of her face. And she had a mass of beautiful hair. She was dressed in a garland of jasmine flowers. And because of her glancing, the movements of her eyebrows, her shy smile, and her very attractive gait. Uh, all the demons, all the leaders of the demons, their hearts were completely overtaken with lust. So then, the demons who had all given up friendship with each other and were fighting with each other, and snatching and throwing the, throwing the pot around, when they saw her, they forgot about the nectar. And thought, oh, how wonderful is this beauty? How wonderful is the luster of her body? How wonder is her fresh youth, youthfulness? And they began to follow behind her. They said, Oh girl with beautiful thighs, you have such beautiful eyes like the petal of a lotus flower. Who are you? Where do you come from? And why did you come here? Whose daughter are you? They said, what to speak of human beings, even devatas, demons, siddhas, gandharvas, charnas, all different types of higher beings of the universe have never even touched you before. We understand this. In other words, when they're saying to her, you have never been touched by anyone, the implication is, you are probably a maiden, you must be a maiden and you've come here to select a husband. So they're all trying to vie for her attention. <clears throat> So they explained to her, See, we're all the descendants of Kasyapa Muni. So we're all brothers. But now we're competing with each other. So we're requesting you. Please, you divide the nectar among us. So we'll not quarrel with each other. So when she was requested in this way by the demons, Mohini, the Supreme Lord in the form of a woman, Mohini Murti, she was smiling and glanced at them. And she said, Oh, descendants of Kasyapa. So every word that she said has an, uh, a dwani, a suggestion. Kasyapa Muni is a great sage. So when she said, Oh, descendants of Kasyapa, what she was really saying was, How come you're so lusty? <laughs> Why do you want to associate with me? A prostitute. Pumschali. A learned person. Never puts his faith in a woman. So here, the meaning is that uh, 
when she said, You are the sons of Kasyapa. She meant to say, How come you've become so lusty and you've now come under the control of me, a woman? And so the demons, they looked at her and said, Of course, we can control our emotions. We never come under the control of a woman. We have, we are not lusty. We've become conquered by your purity. <laughs> to which he said, but I'm just a prostitute. So then, the demigods, the, the demons, they began to laugh. <laughs> She's joking with us. So that's why they said, we know that in your entire life, even from a distance, from your childhood, you have never even uh, inhaled the scent of a male person. That's how pure you are. And you are just saying, I am a prostitute. You are speaking like this to hide your purity. And Oh, beautiful maiden, we'll give you everything. To which she replied, Oh, don't put faith in me if you desire your own good. So they thought again that she was joking, joking with them. Oh demons, she said, jackals and prostitutes are unsteady in their friendship. <laughs> and they always think of newer and newer friends giving up their old friends. That is the opinion of learned scholars. So hearing these words, she's, she's telling him, I am impure, I am a prostitute, don't trust me, that would be the foolish thing. And all the demons are just laughing. She has a sense of humor. <laughs> Another good quality. <laughs> so then, the demons, they were just laughing. And they just gave the nectar to her. They thought, Oh beautiful woman, you are, are you just testing us? We are not faithless and impure. Just take the pot of nectar. You can divide it and give it to us. Or you can drink it yourself. Or you can throw it away. Do as you please. We are yours. We have been purchased by your good qualities. So then, Mohini Murti said, If you accept whatever I do, whether right or wrong, then I will divide the nectar. They all agreed. Yes, yes, of course. So then, the devotees and the demons, they observed the fast. They took bath. They did fire sacrifices. They gave charity uh, to brahmanas. And then they prepared themselves for the nectar distribution ceremony. Sitting on seats made of kush grass with the tips facing to the east. Decorated in new garlands and ornaments. So, they made two lines. On one side was the line all the demons were sitting. And on the other side, all the demigods were sitting. And then, they were all waiting for that uh, important moment. Then Mohini Murti returned. Dressed most beautifully. Carrying the pot of nectar. And... She was smiling and glancing towards the demons, but she went in the direction of the demigods. Her, and she looked at them with uh, her eyes. She was saying, I'll just give a little bit of this Amrita to these weak demigods and I'll, I can give the rest to you. So the, dem the, de the demons, they didn't want to say anything. They didn't want to disagree with her because of their intense attachment. In fact, there were six reasons why they didn't complain or say anything. One, they remained silent because they wanted to keep their agreement. They agreed with her. Whatever she did, they wouldn't complain. Two, they had affection for her, material affection for her. Three, they, they were afraid they didn't want to get into an argument with her. 
Four, they were attached to her. Five, they were afraid of losing her friendship. And finally, they had great respect for her as well. So they just sat there, they didn't say anything, and she was giving the nectar to the devatas. So at that time, one of the demons, Rahu, he disguised himself, he dressed up as a devata, and he went and sat in the line of the devatas, in between the sun god and the moon god. So the sun and the moon, they actually recognized him, but because they were afraid of Rahu, they didn't say anything. They could have said, what are you doing? You're going to sit, you're in the wrong row. <laughs> hmm? But, just when Mohini Moti came close and gave some nectar to him, and he just began to drink it and a drop hmm, went into his mouth, then the sun and the moon, they raised their eyebrows to indicate he's a demon. And at that time, not Mohini Moti, but Ajit, who was nearby, by his chakra, <laughs> cut off the head of Rahu. But because his head had been touched by the nectar, so he didn't die, and Rahu became one Kraha, a planet. And because he, he was his identity was revealed by the sun and the moon, therefore he has enmity to the sun of the moon. So we just had an eclipse on the Purnima, and in two weeks, just less than two weeks time, there'll be another eclipse. So that eclipse means Rahu attacking the moon for lunar eclipse or attacking the sun in the solar eclipse because of his enmity over this situation. So now, there are some mysteries in this part of the pastime. And that is, that all the demons were bewildered by Mohini Murti, so they didn't say anything, they didn't do anything, they didn't complain. Hmm? But Rahu, he did something. right? He got up and he went, he disguised himself and he went to the demigod side. What does that mean? Was he smarter than the others? No. The Supreme Lord in the form of Mohini Murti bewildered all of them, but deliberately by her Shakti did not bewilder him. Deliberately. Because the Supreme Lord wanted to show the potency of Amrita. He wanted to demonstrate the potency of Amrita. So that means even cutting off someone's head by the touch of nectar, they will, the head will stay alive. Therefore, the reason that Rahu was not bewildered in this circumstance was the desire of Mahini Murti. Hmm? And because he was not bewildered, he was the only one who could come up with a plan to thwart this uh, cheating of the demons. So he went to the other line, but then Ajita killed him, or rather cut off his head, just when he was touched by the nectar, in this way to demonstrate the power of Amrita. So, this is a very interesting point, because it, you may have heard this story, but it doesn't occur to you, well, wait a minute, if they're all bewildered, why, was, why did Rahu not get bewildered, and why did he come up with this plan? And so, this is the nature of the Supreme Lord, that he covers or uncovers, he gives ability and takes abilities away, according to his desire. So, Now, what is the teaching behind this? <coughs> the teaching is that both parties, the demons and the demigods, they were in the same place at the same time, doing the same endeavor, but they achieved a different result. Why? Because the demons, they were independent, and, but the demigods, they took shelter of the Supreme Lord. So, this is a very practical thing in life. Devotees, they may be together all doing the same thing. But only those who in their heart they have taken shelter of the Supreme Lord, they will get the success of their practice. If someone is duplicitous, then 
They may make offense. Many problems will come. Still, bhakti is very powerful. So in the end, generally, those who come on this path, they will attain their goal. But there may be a great delay for those who are not fully taking shelter of Sri Krishna within their heart. Charnagati. Anukul yasya sankopa, pratikul yasya vajanam, rakshishatiti vishwaso, gautitve varnam tata, atmanikshepana karpanye, sadvida sharnagati. To accept everything which is favorable, reject everything which is unfavorable for bhakti. To accept the Lord as one's only protector at a time of danger and throughout one's life to be one's maintainer. To always be meek and humble and have no interest separate from the interest of the Lord. To consider, my Lord, nothing is mine, everything is yours, even my soul belongs to you. So when the devotee is actually taking shelter of the Lord, then very quickly, Sharnagati is the doorway to Uttama Bhakti. Then they enter into the direct experience of Bhakti. Utilizing one's pran, his senses, his energy, his wealth, his mind and words to maintain your body, your family members and others is not proper. Why? Because to do any activity other than devotional service is a pratagdrasha. Pratagdrasha. That is our fault. Pratag means separate. And drisha means vision. What is separate from the Lord? Nothing. Nothing at all. So, we have mind, we have senses, we have body, we have some intelligence. If we utilize that for anything other than devotional service, what is the reason? Pritak drisha. We think that something other than the Lord exists. Or things exist independently or separately from the Lord. Therefore, only the service to the Supreme Lord is a proper utilization of our body, mind, pran, senses, intelligence, words, everything. Because only devotional service is in tune with the reality. Only devotional service is that activity which is devoid of pratakdrasha, the sense of independence. <coughs> So only a foolish person would think that the branches of a tree are separate from the tree and try to give water to the branches. So similarly, anyone who is doing any endeavor which is not devotional service is foolish like that person who thinks that the branches are separate from the tree. This is the history or the general shape of this pastime. So we're going to stop there today, deliberate upon it, think about it, the significance of this pastime and how it applies to your own life, your own devotional practice and so on. And in the evening, we're going to examine profound significance of this pastime which is so deep and so beautiful it would be actually impossible to extract that meaning by oneself but our previous acharyas like Srila Jiva Goswami they have given most astonishing explanation it will change your life completely so for now just keep that Leela in your heart and then in the evening some more journey will go on and nectar Nectar will come out. Rasamrita, Bhagavatamrita. Govar Premanande, Hai Hai Ho.